just ahead on American Black Journal. Detroit NAACP President Wendell Anthony talks about the impact of the coronavirus on low-income families and Detroit students. Plus, a look at what's being done to keep the city's homeless population safe during the pandemic. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal, partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Governors across the country are making plans to slowly reopen the economy, even as the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases has surpassed 1 million. However, schools are not expected to open anytime soon. Today, we'll take a look at the future of education and getting back to business as usual. Plus, it appears stay-at-home orders and social distancing are helping to reduce the spread of COVID-19. But what happens when you don't have a home to go to. Coming up, I'll talk with Dr. Chad Audie from the Detroit Rescue Mission Ministries about the challenges of protecting the area's homeless population. But first, I had a great conversation, as always, with Reverend Wendell Anthony of the Detroit NAACP about the pandemic's impact on Detroiters, on the economy, and the digital divide. I just want to start with your thoughts about what we're living through, especially here in the city of Detroit, especially in communities like your church or your neighborhood. Uh, I think it's hard for people who are not experiencing that to really understand what it's like. Well, I'm glad you raised that, Stephen, and my prayers and thoughts go out to all the families who've lost loved ones who are illness, who have the families that are dealing with this. I think about the people in nursing homes and healthcare facilities that can't even touch or see their people. Uh, my prayers and thoughts and thanks go to all of the workers, doctors, nurses, RNs, CNs, EMS workers, delivery people, sanitation workers. God bless you because they're barely putting their lives on the line. And a lot of them, Stephen, are experiencing quarantine because they can't even go home to see their own family because they don't want to infect them. So God bless you. I know that it has affected us personally. The church has been closed down. For a month, basically, we're going to live stream, and I'm glad we're able to do that. And I pray that those churches who don't have it are able to get it. It has made a difference. We are a kissing, hugging, loving church. And so I miss that. We miss that. There have been deaths in our, in our church. Um, I'm doing a funeral this afternoon. Today is uh, Wednesday, and I'm doing a funeral uh, in about an hour. Only 10 people can be there, and uh, we'll be wearing facial masks. And, distance and that's no way uh, to remember your loved one but that's what we're called to do in my own family uh, my uh, great uncle who was really like my older brother mm. we grew up together uh, he passed his wife is suffering from the illness she just found out after two weeks that he was gone mm. um, and so we're dealing with that my, I have a cousin who was my, my little brother uh, who passed uh, and um, we are not able to embrace them, and we are a big, close family. So it has impacted us, to say the least, about the impact in Michigan and African-American communities, the city of Detroit. You know the disparity of health care. Forty yeah. percent of the people from Michigan, African-Americans, are on the death rows, and we're just 14 percent of the population. That's true in Illinois. 
uh, city of Chicago, that's true in Louisiana, that's true in most urban cities across the country, the healthcare disparity. We have a pandemic within the pandemic because you and I, Stephen, know that these disparities have been here for a long time. We've been talking about them. And now there's been a great spotlight shined upon all of this. And now we see what we've been talking what we've been talking about for years. And so if we don't come out on the other side of this better, then shame on us for not having gotten the message. Yeah. So, so give me a sense of uh, what it's been like for you as a pastor right now, trying to give people comfort, obviously right now, but, but also hope uh, yes. for the future that this will end and I guess our lives will come back together at some point. Oh, no question about it. And I don't think we'll ever be the same. Uh, and in some cases, we should not be the same. Um, I think the physical distancing, and I don't call it social distancing, I think, I think that's the wrong term. Yeah. Because we can be socially connected, and we are, but we're physically distanced from yeah. each other. Black folks are socially connected. We are gregarious people. And so for me as a pastor, uh, I send out pastoral points every week trying to make little antidotes, using stories to comfort people. We're online every Sunday morning, fellowshipchapel.org, 930, and tune in and get a good word and good song. Uh, I send out robocalls uh, to try to remind them and to give them hope and inspiration. And so I know a number of churches are trying to do the same thing, but it's really difficult. And I try to let folk know that we've been here before. before. This is not the first pandemic that we've experienced. Now, it may be the first one that we have experienced, but if you go back to 1918 uh, in terms of the Spanish flu and the toll that that took, if you go back to SARS, if you go back to the Ebola situation, if you go back to all of those issues, the H1N1 that, that our nation experienced, what we've experienced though, uh, back then is a professional kind of honest approach and leadership that really comfort us and that make people feel as though they have hope. Right now, we don't have that. Yeah. We have a person who unfortunately has led us down the primrose path, who talked about it was going to go away by a miracle, who talked about that it was a hoax, a fix. Uh, he did not listen to the United Nations the World Health Organization. He did not listen to his own advisors. He did not listen and does not listen to the scientists and the doctors. He put himself in the way of information. He's lying every day when he gets to the podium about the true status of what our nation is in. And I pray that those scientists remember, those doctors remember their Hippocratic oath, uh, which is given to the people and not to the president and tell us the truth. So when in all of that, Stephen, we find ourselves as ministers, as faith leaders, trying to give our people hope to say that there is a brighter day coming. You know, the tree only recognizes how strong it is, is when it's still standing after the storm is over. Yeah. That's why we sang in the church, the storm is passing over, because we know we're in a storm. And let me say this, an ego does not fly through the storm, the ego flies above the storm. Right. On the other side. I, I wonder what you make of uh, the response here in the city, uh, given the disproportionate impact. I mean, uh, this is the nation's largest African-American big city. Uh, we are suffering way more than, uh, than our neighbors are. Uh, has the city done what it should be doing to, to try to get us through this? I think that uh, overall, uh, I give the city... Uh, uh, a good mark. I think that we need testing, 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 and more testing. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's not enough testing. That's why testing should be localized in the neighborhoods. And I think one of the reasons that they have not done that, so I've been told, is because they don't have the equipment and the, the materials and the personnel to go out like they want. I know that Wayne State University is now doing mobile health care units that are going around the city. I know we have volunteered our church as a test site. I'm glad that Brother Hall Sheffield through Daybo had a one day testing situation. We're in that same kind of a situation. We want to do that. We provided a materials face mask. We did 4,000 face masks through support from the UAW. 
uh, in terms of people. They lined up from Greenfield to Southfield. We also provided uh, monies with the support of TCF, $50 cards uh, for them to get um, sanitation materials and healthcare materials and food items. Uh, we provided that uh, to churches and denominations around the city, thanks to Gary Torgo and TCF Bank. I do think that the city can do more and is needing to do more. I think my Mayor Duggan has moved the instant kind of results from the testing program that they're doing, which is different than a lot of cities have. That's a good thing. I think that uh, the getting of more testing people who are first responders, grocery stores, that's a good thing because we congregate in those facilities. And I want to say this, Stephen, mm -hmm. that to seniors out there, they are still playing the numbers. They're going and playing the lottery, thinking that they can win, but they're not taking the best measures for their own health care. And so they, the state needs to look at that. I mean, as you cancel other things, you need to look at whether or not, because they reach in there and they get the ticket and they put it in that little slot underneath the window. They're using the same pen and pencil. A lot of them don't have gloves. So sometimes we have to take measures for them. But I'm glad overall that we're moving in that direction. And, and, and you know, Stephen, last week, we were able to announce 51,000 laptops hey. for Detroit public school kids uh, and connection to the internet. We're the only city that I'm aware of that has done that. That's K-12. Yeah. That's unheard of, Stephen Henderson. Yeah. I mean, and so when we talk about the, the effort of the city, and I want to thank um, uh, Jerry Norcia and DTE Energy, Nancy and their team, Nancy Moody and their team. I want to thank Tanya Allen and the Skillman Foundation. I want to thank uh, Faye Nelson and Kellogg's. I want to thank... Uh, Dan Gilbert and Bill Emerson from Quicken Loans and Rock Mortgage. I want to thank the mayor of the city, Mike Duggan, who was a part of this, who helped to push this. And this came about because I looked at my little, little daughter. She's blessed. She got two cell phones. <laughs> she got two laptops. She knows all our codes. She <laughs> owns everything. And I say, but, but that's my baby. Everybody don't have it like that. Oh, and, I'm, I'm, and I always believe that you're blessed to be a blessing. So I said, what can we do right now? The kids are out of school. They shouldn't be idle. They need to learn. So I put that piece together called It Takes a Village. We need something like a Marshall Plan, like they did after World War II in Western Europe. They right. rebuilt Europe, the United States, did that. We need to do that here after the devastation of COVID-19. And I sent it to people all around the city. I sent it to DTE. I sent him. I sent it and thank Mark Royce and his team. I sent it to Ford. I sent it to Quicken, I sent it Skillman and, and to the mayor, I sent it to everybody. Jerry Norcia got the spirit from mm -hmm. DTE. He said, I like this, let me talk to my people and you talk to you. We did that, I spoke to the mayor, he said, I like it, whoever you want me to call, I'll call, he did. And on last Monday, we had a conference call, Stephen, 40 to 50 business people were on it. Thursday of last week, we had a press conference. We announced $23 million to develop and to purchase laptops and put folk on the internet. And right now, we got the laptops. We still want other businesses and foundations to step up. It shows that if you have a mind to do the right thing, then you can do the right thing. And I just thank God that I'm in the city of Detroit and been able to be used like this. And I thank God because it takes an entire village to raise a child. And in this case, the village seemed to have come together. Yeah, it, it, it's a really uh, important dimension of this in that it thinks about the future, right? You're doing this now, but these are, these are families that will be able to take advantage of this forever. Absolutely, because what happens now is that the children will not only be on the internet, I'm thinking of the little boy and girl or the young adult uh, who will look at this, who will build confidence, who will be online, who can do their college and high school applications. I'm thinking about the parent who can now go for job information, who will be connected uh, to the social media of the world. Poor children, Stephen, who would not have an opportunity, who can come up and out of poverty. This helps them in terms of the poverty index because it puts them on par with other kids who already have these advantages. So if I'm on Linwood, if I'm on Dexter, if I'm on Joy, 
Come on, Mac and Beat Wake. If I'm on Gratia, go on Six Mile, Seven Mile, Cinco, Joy Road, I now have access to what everybody else has access to, which means I'm not at a deficit. God didn't make no mistake when he made me where I am. And out of this experience, out of mayhem, comes this miracle of good work that we're all doing in the city of Detroit. So God bless everybody who has made a difference in this situation. Dr. Chad Adi, welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So let's start with uh, the population you serve, uh, which is always in need, uh, is always in distress. Uh, but of course, a pandemic makes that worse. Give us a yeah. sense of what the last few weeks have been like for Detroit uh, Rescue Mission Ministries. Well, uh, we had to increase our protocols and then in the same times we had more uh, calls for our services. So now we're serving more people and then in the same time we had to increase the protocols when people are coming in. So in general we used to serve about 2,200 people every single day Right now, our average is about 2,500 people every single day. Wow. And, the, and, then so that, and because of the new protocols that we had to put in, for example, we had to test everybody, their temperature from day one as they're coming into our facilities. We had to increase the numbers of uh, uh, disinfectant for everything that we do uh, more routinely every two hours versus twice, uh, three times a day or within the 24 hours. Uh, also, uh, the, uh, we had to open at least now three new buildings because mm -hmm. we have to make sure that uh, the social distances is in place. We no longer can use one room for two people. They have to be separate. And we can't use any more the dorm without having people spaced up to six feet apart. We can't use any more the communal dining we would have to do it uh, where we bring food to everyone. And then sometimes uh, we bring only 10 people to the dining area and they will be totally spaced out. But in certain rooms, uh, when we have a quarantine site for people with COVID-19 positive, we would have to bring them their own food. And, and also that added on us uh, that we have to get all the PPE equipment. And depending on who is in contact with the population that we are serving, it could be higher demand on what type of PPE we have to do. Yeah. So for the people who are in, in, in contact with the COVID-19 positive, then they would have to wear gongs and they would have to wear different goggles, face shields, and all those kind of stuff versus the regular people that they, it's sufficient for them to just to wear a mask and the gloves. Uh, so this is some of the challenges and the new things that we have been seeing lately. Uh, are you seeing, you're, you're seeing additional population, um, but give us an idea of how prevalent uh, infections are among your population. Is it, is it worse there than it is among, among the general population? Actually, uh, luckily, we don't have, uh, it's better than the general population, and that's because we have put in place immediately uh, all the shelter client and everybody, they have to be sheltered in place. We don't allow them to leave. So we had to keep them 24-7. Mm -hmm. And then we had implemented the measures where we can detect uh, if they have any of the symptoms or uh, if they immediately get positive to ship them directly to a quarantine site. Uh, so we do have a number, but luckily and thank God, it is not as bad as the general population. Uh, especially when we're talking to a population who are homeless and yes. usually don't take care of their health. They don't have doctors that they go to, and most of them have a lot of underlying uh, health issues. So I think with those measures that we put in place and shelter in place, it really helped. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, right now are thinking of uh, lessons to take from this that we can apply after this is over and we're trying to kind of put the world back together. Uh, again, I, I wonder if you've noticed things that you feel like we ought to be thinking about with regard to your population. 
Well, number one, uh, p people should always be reminded that the population that we serve are a normal population and they're not just numbers. Mm -hmm. They just been put in, the, in the bad situations. Uh, they lost a job, they lost uh, a connection with the family. So they're not really bad people and we don't look at them as cases. They're a human being and if they get the opportunity to work like everybody else, they would love to. Some of them have underlying health issue that really does not able them to do the lifting, especially if they're not educated and they want to work on the uh, level, entry level jobs that requires a lot of physical activities. They, not, might, they might not be able to do it simply because they can't do it out of physical conditions, not because they're lazy. Now, there are some people, we, we don't rule out that there are certain people who are lazy and who does not want to work, but that's not the majority of the people. The other, uh, the other issue is the mental health. We have a lot of people, after closing the mental health institution, that they're wandering the street and they don't have no place to go, so they come to the shelters. Also, they're not bad people. They don't know the, the circumstances that they're in. If they knew, they wouldn't be in the situation they're in. So we want to remind people and look at them now. When we told them this is the orders and this is what it could be, they abided by the rules and the numbers among them, what everybody was thinking is going to be catastrophic with the homeless population, turned out the number was not as bad as it is. And that's simply because we talked to them as a human and we explained to them what's going on and they abided by the rules that the governor and the local city and us as a shelter we put in place and they did not really fight us for it. Uh, you know, so that's, that's what I want people to remember, that this is good people and they yeah. need the help that they need at all time and to be looked at as a human being, yeah. nothing else. So I also wonder if you feel like uh, DRMM and other institutions like yours are getting the support that you need to deal with something on, on this scale. Yeah, the, the truth is, for the first time, I can say that we had a very good relationship with the city of Detroit. It was a great relationship uh, beyond our expectation. Uh -huh. They brought their resources to us. They brought their nurses. And this is another advantage that uh, caused our population to be less affected because the, health, the, the Detroit Health Department were able to mobilize all their nurses to do a routine check on all our population at least three times a week. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot on them. And uh, they were readily available for us on any suggestion that we do to help the population within the limited resources that they have as well. So we all work together. And that was a great mm -hmm. thing. On the public side, we got a lot, a lot of people also got motivated and they've been helping us and they've been calling us. We can't get volunteers like before because of the social distancing uh, so we are encouraging people if they want to donate at this time, it would be better to donate more of the cash that we need because we have to buy uh, the equipment that, that needed and, and we are spacing up people. And you know, to put it in perspective, we have to cook every day about 6,000 to 6,500 meals every single day because we have to do three meals and the people are staying inside. And that requires a lot of help, but there is, Detroit, as always, the people in Detroit work together, we tackle the issues, they rise up all together, and we've never seen such unity and love like we are seeing today. That is our program for this week. Check out more episodes at AmericanBlackJournal.org and connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We're going to end on a lighter note with a reboot of a performance last year by the Detroit Jazz Festival All-Star Generation Band. Enjoy, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.
From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal, partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you.